Uh, I'm sitting with Kim McCauley, who is a teaching award winner in applied science. Um, Kim, before we turn to the class that, that was videotaped, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your philosophy of teaching, um, how you teach, why you teach the way you do, what your objectives are. Yes. Okay. Well, I like to use a lot of examples when I teach, and I like students to start with something particular that they care about and they can imagine, and then take those experiences and maybe even derive some mathematics from some particular things that they know about, and then generalize and then use those generalities to solve other problems that they're less familiar with. So I like my teaching to be more about discovery for the students rather than me just foisting things upon them and expecting them to, uh, to learn. Another thing that I spend, one thing that I spend a lot of time on in my teaching is setting final examinations because I, I post all of my old final examinations on the website for the course and I know that every student who takes that course in all of the years to come will do those final exam problems. They may not do any of the unmarked assignments or anything like that, but they will do those old exam questions. And so if I set a high standard there and make sure that to do those questions they have to understand all of the concepts that I want them to know, then I have uh, then I've really done something. So I like to make them interesting and I set them not so much for the day of the exam, but for the but for the future students who will do those uh, who will do those problems and learn from them. So far, when we've been thinking about inputs to chemical processes, we've been thinking about putting in step changes, um, just adjust the position of a valve from one position to another, and then let it stay at the new uh, at the new level, or change the temperature of an inflow stream, or change the concentration of an inlet stream to a, uh, to a reactor vessel. What we're going to talk about today is s what happens when we start putting in oscillating inputs, so sine waves or cosines, into a, uh, into a process. And you might ask, why on earth would we care? One of the things you did early on, or do early on in, in the class, is ask uh, your students, and I think in a way you've already sort of spoken to this, uh, you ask them, why should we care about this subject? Yes. Uh, and then go on to explain why. Is that something you do quite often? I, I often do that because if, if, I, if I don't care about something, then I certainly can't, can't learn it. So if you give me a book and assign me to read something, and if I don't know what it's for or why I might use it, it's, it's kind of useless to me. And so even in my research, I'm only interested in things I say, can you sell it or can you eat it? That's, <laughs> those are two of my criteria for deciding whether something is worth, uh, is worth pursuing. And so I guess my own kind of bias on what kind of inquiry appeals to me is uh, get, I, that, that shows through and I try to get my students to think about what this is for. Um, you already talked about examples. Um, in, this, in this class, uh, you used an example of a bathtub uh, throughout, <laughs> um, which actually for me was wonderful because I could, even I could imagine that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about, about using examples and, and how they work? Yeah, I like to make sure that I have examples that are accessible and that even if we're mostly going to be thinking about controlling some chemical plant that people don't know anything about yet, I like to use examples of um, automation and control from people's homes and from people's lives so that the ideas aren't so foreign to them and so they can immediately understand what is feedback control, what is it about, what is it for, oh I already have some kind of basis and I have an understanding for this and now I can uh, can go can go further. Let's think, we need to do a thought experiment. Let's think if we take any stable system and put in a sinusoidal system. So we're going to put in a sinusoidal input. So I want you all to imagine that you're at home and you're in your bathtub. Actually you should imagine that you're at my house and you're in my bathtub. Because my bathtub has one of those has one of those um, taps that um, if you pull over to this side, then just hot water comes out. If you put it over on this side, then just cold water comes out of the faucet. And you should imagine that while you're in the bathtub, you are um, stirring the water so that the temperature is uniform throughout. And so you're in my bathtub. And you're oscillating. Oh, the bathtub is pretty full of water. So it's going out through the overflow, you know, the one that keeps it from, if you keep running water in, that it keeps it from running out on the floor. So you're in my bathtub. You're swir swirling with one hand, 
You've got the, uh, <laughs> you're oscillating in a sinusoidal fashion with the, uh, with the uh, faucet controller, with the tap back and forth. Okay. And what's going to happen to the temperature that you feel in the water in the bathtub is if you, st so you start up, imagine we start with the bathtub pretty full and you get in and uh, then you start oscillating the, the temperature of the inlet stream back and forth, mixing it up. Then the temperature in the bathtub water is going to oscillate up and down. And after a while, if you wait long enough and you stay in the bathtub and keep oscillating it back and forth, the frequency at which you oscillate the uh, tap back and forth is going to be the same if you plotted the temperature in the bathtub over time. It's going to be the same as the frequency of the oscillations in the temperature. You can give someone a problem and it's too difficult for them to do. It's too complicated and they really don't know. But if you ask them four easy questions, and they, can, they know enough to answer the first one, and after they've answered the first, then they can do the second, and then do the third, and then do the fourth, and they go, Eureka, now I can do the whole question that she asked me originally, and, it was, uh, and that was way too hard. So I, I, I do that in the statistics course that I'm teaching uh, this term in the fall term. 2.094J times 2.094J. Well, if I multiply 2.094, if I square it, I get 4.384. J squared. What's J squared? Negative 1. Even if they don't respond verbally, you can see their faces and you can tell whether they're lost or they're bored or if they're asleep. If they're asleep, well, they try to come and stay awake and they're just tired, so you leave those ones alone. But if they look confused, then I'll say, if I, if I know their names, and sometimes I'll do, I'll say, hey, you're looking a bit uh, puzzled or confused. Could you, could you tell us about this? And so some students, I have to be a little bit careful because that makes some students feel, feel nervous. So at the beginning of the course, I ask all of the students who wouldn't like me to pick them out and ask them a question about how they're feeling or what they think about a certain issue, and then I'll leave those alone. But the rest are kind of fair game. So if someone doesn't really have their hand up, but they... They, they look puzzled or they're thinking about something, I'll ask them, you know, what are you thinking about this? And, uh, and I always tell them that I'm really happy to get a wrong answer. And so there's no shame in giving a wrong answer. Please do it, because if you give me a wrong answer, then lots of other people in the class also aren't understanding, and sometimes we can learn more. 0.564J. It's looking a little bit better. Suggestions for how I can get this in the form A plus bj. I've got to find out what the value of a is and what the b is. And this is our g at j omega. So what do you do to get rid of this horrible complex number on the bottom? You guys know this trick, yeah? Uh, you multiply the complex by the denominator. Um, not exactly by the denominator. By the complex, complex conjugate of the denominator, yeah. So we can multiply by 3.6152 minus 12.564J. Yeah. On my teaching evaluations, I get a few comments every year about, I'm nervous in your class because I worry that you might ask me a question. But mostly I get positive uh, comments about how the classes are interactive and engaging. So you can't make, can't make everybody happy, but I, I try. <laughs> I do use PowerPoint slides, and, the, so this, and I post those on the web, and so students can write on them. But I specifically leave space where we'll have some question or we'll stop and do some example on the blackboard. And I think that rather than just, you know, flash equation after equation in PowerPoint slides, people can't learn that way, at least I can't. And there's so much information conveyed when someone does mathematics on a blackboard about the order they do things in, what they're thinking. You can stop halfway through in the middle of writing something, get some more ideas, write some notes down. And um, so the, the blackboard is very important. And I, I don't think I would, OK, I could use a whiteboard or I could use a uh, document camera, but I, I need to be able to sort of write in, in real time. Because I get, if you have a good lecture, then you get lots of feedback from the students and they 
they want to talk about things in different orders and so it can't all come pre-prepared. Mm -hmm. A big part of the course that I teach is about mathematical modeling. So it's about describing chemical processes using mathematical models. And so I like to model modeling, really, the process of doing this because I could present them with, you know, here is a model for this kind of chemical reactor and here is a model for a heat exchanger. But whenever you go out and someone has designed something new, students need to know how to to build a new model of something that they've never seen a model for before. And it's like, it's like learning to play the violin, I guess, that we all should maybe do some playing together and then they'll see and develop confidence that, oh, I can figure this out all on my own. I have this sort of toolkit and I can get some tools out and uh, depending on what assumptions I make, I can make myself some equations and then I'll have a model and won't that be uh, won't that be lovely and I like the students when we're doing mathematical modeling I like them to pick some things about what assumptions we'll make and what assumptions you make when you're doing this modeling mm -hmm. exercise depends on the physical process that you're really modeling and so I say well you know can we assume that the temperature is going to be held constant is the density of the material going to change and so they, and then they'll pick some things that are going to make the problem difficult and then we work through and see, oh my goodness, look at the consequences of this assumption that, that you guys picked out for me. And so it gives them confidence that if they can't make some standard assumptions that people like to make, that they can work through and find out what's going to happen. But it also um, gives them a healthy respect for the people who tend to make these simplifying assumptions which may not be quite true because it makes your life so much simpler <laughs> if, you can, uh, if you can afford to make them. I used to teach first year chemistry to, to all 600 oh engineering God. students in three sections of 200 and I would give the same lecture three times a day and I managed to keep those as very interactive lectures and it was it was quite fun because I would I learned a lot about teaching because I would get to try things out and pilot them and so I could do things differently in the three lectures during the same day and see how they worked out and, and students would interactively solve problems with me so I would put it up and then use the document camera and ask them what step we should do next and I would do the same problem interactively with them three times in the same day and the way they approached the solution and the order they did something in was different every single time it was amazing I have them do some computer-based assignments and I always make sure that they work in pairs or group of three, groups of three, because I think they learn a lot from each other and then they have discussions and, uh, and they get a lot more benefit out of these kind of problem-based learning assignments than if they just worked on them by themselves. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you were to be giving some advice to someone who was beginning to teach in chemical engineering or beginning to teach at all, what, what, what would you say to them? Don't be afraid to try some new things and don't be afraid to, uh, to, to fail at them and uh, don't be afraid to, if you try something and it doesn't work, to, to go back to what, you were, uh, to what you were doing before as well. And look around, talk about teaching, get advice. So that's our job for next class, okay? Thank you all.